If you have used Next.js or you are keeping up to date with the React world, you have probably heard of React Server Components. Today I want to do an overview of what React Server Components are, the problems they're trying to solve, and also explain some odd behaviors you may have seen from them and explain why these occur. So to get started with a deep dive onto what React Server Components are, I first need to take a tour of what came before, so client-side rendering and also server-side rendering. So to jump into it, we'll talk about client-side rendering. So client side is what you may have seen if you built an application with create next app and now create next app is actually recommended not to use. So if we look at the react.dev documentation, you won't actually see a mention of create next app anymore. It will actually tell you uh, if you want to build a new website, they recommend picking a react powered framework. So you've got frameworks like Remix or Next.js, Gatsby and various things like this. So as I said, that's not what's recommended by react anymore. But what Create Next app would essentially do is, let's say a user goes to my website, so jameshopland.com, the server would actually return some HTML that looks like this. So it will just literally have a div with a root in it, and then it will simply have a script with a bundle.js. And that's just literally the HTML the client would receive. That script tag with the bundle.js is what would include all of the application code and also all of the third party libraries that you've uh, inserted. Once downloaded, that would then be passed and then React would load that and it would have to insert within this root component all of the things that you've coded within your application. So as you see here, later when React and the JavaScript has been passed and gone over this, it's then inserted into that div ID root, all of this stuff here. Now, obviously the issue with this is you're downloading all of the bundle.js, all of the third party code and it's being run straight away. So the user will sit there sort of staring at a blank screen for a while while this is downloading and waiting for it to be passed. But then they'll have all of this application. And the important thing to know about this is this is what a single page application is. So when they navigate to another page, so you have React Router and you're going to an About page, it would now download instantly because you've already downloaded it in that bundle JS. As I said, it's a single page application. So all of the code for the next page will already be within React and it will simply just change the contents of this div here. So there wouldn't be any additional loading after that unless you had data to fetch later. As I said, the issue with this becomes as your application scales, your bundle is going to get larger. Now people did come and optimize this later. So we had optimizations called chunk splitting. And you'll see this when you use things like Vi and various other things, and you'll use lazy loading with React Router. So what chunk splitting was, was essentially as we go to a page, say when we first start our application, we would get the main.js file, which is 46 kilobytes. And this is needed for every single route that you would go to within your application. So as I said, when you first load up the page, you'll get this instead of the bundle.js. But now say you wanna to go to slash about, and it has maybe an extra button on it that no other page has. Well, that JavaScript will be bundled in a separate file called a chunk. So when you now navigate to that page, the JavaScript will know it needs to go and fetch another JavaScript file and load that in. But it already has some of the JavaScript because it's loaded this previously in that main one, which was needed for every root. But now you can essentially separate some of your JavaScript needs. So not all of this needed to be combined within this first initial bundle. So that was how chunk splitting came in to sort of help that out. And we also had things such as lazy loading, which goes along with chunk splitting. So you could lazy load part of your application. So only when they were needed, as I said, would it start to download the JavaScript for it. Now, as, um, as I mentioned, that was the downsides for it as it led to those really large initial download size, which are really important metrics for your users sticking around and their experience is when they first click on a link, say on Google or something, that they see some results instantly. It's a really important metric for businesses. The other important metric for businesses was search engine optimization. So what would happen with crawlers would they would often miss the content because they wouldn't be loading in JavaScript. So they would actually just see this and it would just say you need to enable JavaScript to run this app. Now, eventually they did sort of catch on and they were able to sort of process the React and load in some of the content. However, it was still a bit of a odd issue sometimes. It just wouldn't work properly. So what came next was server-side rendering. And you saw this from frameworks such as Gatsby. So server-side rendering, essentially as the user would visit jameshopland.com, is the server would now return some HTML with everything in it that we need. So as you saw before, what we had was that HTML here. This was all that's being returned in that client-side routing. But now what we have is the server is gonna return 
with all of the HTML in it, because essentially what the server's done, gun and done, is it's loaded that page for us and seen what HTML needs to be sent to the client. So what we've done is we've gone to jameshopman.com. The server then has loaded the page essentially within React. It said, what HTML do I need to send to the client? And it sent all of this HTML formatted like this. So the user would see something initially, they would see all of this sort of code and they would get your CSS as well when that's downloaded in. Obviously you could have inline styles as well, but essentially the user would see something pretty much near instantaneously as they downloaded the HTML. But you do still need a bundle.js. And the reason you need the bundle.js is say we had a button in here, for example, the button when you clicked on it wouldn't be able to do anything because it'd be rendering in from pure HTML. It would have no JavaScript attached to it. So if you had some use state, some use effects that this button needed to tie into, it wouldn't be able to do that because as I said, this is just the HTML. The JavaScript would then come later and it would have React in it. And this was the process that React called hydration. So React would come in, it would see all of your code here and it'd be able to attach itself to the elements that it needed to where it knows it's needed. So for example, if the server rendered that button and we had a button here instead of this A tag, React would then on the client's device, go over it and say, ah, oh, that's the button related to this component that has this use effect on it and add that JavaScript in later. So the site wouldn't technically be interactive when it first loads. However, it would have been visible. Now we can actually see an example of what I've been talking about here. So with Create Next app, if I go into this and I just quickly disable JavaScript. So this was a simple application built with Create Next app and I refresh the page, you will see that we'll see absolutely nothing. Now, if I go to another website such as National Geographic, which has been built with Gatsby apparently, if I now go into here and say, I click on my menu, if I inspect element, if I click on my menu, you'll see that this will pop up. So this is running JavaScript at the moment. If I inspect the page and turn off JavaScript, so disable JavaScript, and I give that a refresh again, what you'll see is we, we actually have content here. It, it pretty much looks the same. And all of this is actually gonna be clickable because these are using A tags, which are just in HTML and can just navigate to a new link. However, what you'll notice now is if I keep clicking on this menu, nothing will happen. That's because this has been coded with JavaScript to react to an event of on click. However, there is no JavaScript loaded. JavaScript would then be needed to come in later. And as I said, that's what React calls hydration and hydrate that component and know that it has that on click event. So that is server side rendering. So the server handles the rendering of it. So it gets out some HTML. So here we have the HTML, the images, the CSS, that can all be downloaded. And then React will go in later and make the things interactive that it needs to make interactive. So that is sort of the idea of client side rendering and server side components. And this is, or server side rendering, sorry, but that's the important distinction is these are not React server components. What are React server components then? Well, essentially you'll see here, we have a very basic example of what one is. And this is from an application made by Lee Robinson, who works for Facel to explain essentially what React server components are. It was a demo of it, which is just a Hacker News um, demo site. I'll show you this in a minute. But essentially we have this function here and you'll notice it's async for a start, this server component. And the other thing is we can fetch data or even make database calls to our own database within the component. And this is really, really cool. And this will only ever be rendered on the server. That's the really important thing to know about server components is essentially React on the server will see this. It will say, what HTML can I generate from this and send to the user? And once it's sent to the user, it will not send any JavaScript related to that component. So this fetch won't go in there. What this has said allows you to do is put in your own database calls to your own database without worrying about leaking that to the front end user. So you could have your own fetch API with your own API key in it in this fetch call, and it wouldn't get leaked to the user because when this is sent to the user, that fetch call would have been done on the server and already put into the HTML for you and no JavaScript will be sent over with that. So as, as it says here, this server renders it into HTML and only that will be sent. But what if we did want a button on this, for example? Well, if we wanted a button, we would have to use this directive use client. Now, this is what you may see around in various applications if you've gone through them and you may have been confused by it. But this use client is essentially telling React when you're using React server components, say in Next.js, for example, that this is now a client component because React server components work on a sort of paradigm where everything is a React server component unless told otherwise, which is really great when you're building out your applications because you sort of don't have to think about it 
until you have to think about it. And Next.js will show you an error saying you need to you make a client component out of this. So it's just really handy for that. But essentially, if we're going to be using effect, using state, going to have on clicks, we need a client component because all of that has to be done on the user's device because otherwise, how would you know they clicked on something? So we put this use client directive up here. And this just tells React, as I said, that this is now a client component. Go in and send the JavaScript for it. Hydrate that component as well on that client device. And that's exactly what React will do. So they'll now download a JavaScript file, which just contains the JavaScript needed for this component, not the ones needed for any server components. So if you just had a simple head attack, it wouldn't send the JavaScript needed for React to render that. That would be rendered already in the HTML on the server. It would simply send over just this JavaScript needed for the button. An important thing to note is that this button can be server side rendered still. So it, the server will still render the button tag in the HTML. So as I said, with the anchor tag here, if we switch this out for a button, the server would still send this over as server side rendering if you were using that. However, again, it wouldn't be interactive unless we hydrated it later. Next thing to note on all of this is but what if we needed some higher level state? So what I'm going to do here is I've got some examples here, but if I move over to a Next.js application, so let's say I go into a Next.js application that I've worked on that had a theme provider. So the theme provider was used to tell every other application whether I was in dark mode or light mode or in the system default mode, which was essentially what the user had asked for. And with that, I use this later in a mode toggle. And this is just essentially says use theme. So it's getting the theme from the React context. And then it's using that theme um, to display a mode toggle. And it will obviously have to know what the theme is. But as I said, theme provider here, because it's tying into React context, it needs to be using clients. You'll notice here we have use client. And then it's just going to simply pass all of the children through. But the problem here is we're using Next.js and we're using the layout component. So everything is wrapped in this theme provider, which has use client in it. So is everything under it now a client component? Well, no. And this is where things get a little weird with server components. So as I mentioned, the server components, essentially, when we have a server component, such as the mode toggle, everything imported in here has to be a client component as well. Sorry. So when we have a client component, now everything imported will need to be a client component as well. We import anything else, it needs to be a client component. So this is where when you're building an XJS application with React server components, you really need to think about where exactly you need your state. But as I mentioned, we can still have the children of that provider be server components. So this is the tricky bit, is React server components work on an import basis. So anything imported into this needs to be a client component. However, things passed to it technically don't have to be. So we're actually a using theme provider here and we're importing it. But then site footer, site header, these could still be server components because they're not imported in that client component. They're just used later by that client component. As far as React server components is concerned, it will read the layout file and see what it needs to render on the server. So it will go in and render this on the server and then it will go into theme provider and say, ah, oh, that needs to be on the client, but the children could still technically have been passed through as a server component. So that's the bit that gets a little bit tricky for people as they, they come across these errors with theme providers and realize they need it at the top level of their application, but how can they do that with server components? So that's the way they do it. Now to show you the benefits, of course, of React server components, if I just go back to this site, I'll show you the site I was talking about earlier with Lee Robinson and that Hacker News example. If I go into this and inspect, what you see here is we have a really quick loading site, which is just a clone of what Hacker News would be. And again, I'll do the same thing of disabling JavaScript in here, and I'll refresh the page. And you'll see that it all loads in for me. And as I said, that's because this is now server-side rendered. All of this is using React server components. And the other important thing is, I'm not making any fetch calls on my, my side, on the client side. It's not making any fetch calls to get this Hacker News data. This was all gone by the server. So as I said, that's really cool for when we need to contact our own database or want to use our own API key to use a private API we have and not have the user do that. Because before you'd have to abstract that away to your own API that would then make another API call with your private key in it. 
and there would be a lot of security implications that you'd need to take care of there. With this, you can simplify some really basic apps to not even have API endpoints because you can now just literally put a fetch straight in to your React server component as I showed up here. The other really cool thing is with the way that we sort of have to think about this, because as I said, now everything will become a child component. So you really do need to think about where sort of you need those states and different things. And it's just really cool for basic things like headers and footers are all gonna be server side now. And it's really simple for things like that. Now you may be asking why, why, why this over, what do I pick? Do I pick client side? Do I pick server side? Do I pick React server components? Well, the answer to this is essentially you're picking both. When you use Next.js, you're using a combination of server side rendering and React server components. As I said before, when we have used client, it doesn't mean that it's not server side rendered. It means it's not a React server component. This can still be server side rendered in so much as it will go in and see what HTML is needed to be sent. But then it will also send JavaScript later. Remember, React server components send no JavaScript with them. They're pure HTML, but all of it is done on the server and it will never reach the client. Whereas when you have a client component, Technically, it's rendered on the server first, but then it also has to send it to the client to render or hydrate with React. So what this means for server components and another important thing that trips people up is this will only ever be rendered once. So it will only ever render on the server. So let's say we had a call for get time or get date within that. What would be returned would only ever be the date of when the server rendered that and it would never update because it's pure HTML now. It won't have the JavaScript to update that time. So that's another thing that can really trip people up. So if you have like, say a light counter that you're getting from your database, it wouldn't update as it was updating. You would need to then make that a client component if you wanted that component to update in the future. That is a really top level overview of what React server components are. And they get even cooler than that. They have things such as forms and server actions where you then use a directive called use server instead of use client. However, this is such a big topic that I actually plan on having another video on Next.js forms and their server actions. If any of this has confused you, please leave a comment and I will try and answer it. I'll also try and leave some resources in the description below to answer any of your questions. If you learned anything new here, please leave a comment as well. Please like and please subscribe. Thank you very much for watching.